you would, let's turn back in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13 again this morning. Hebrews chapter 13. Last week, our treatment of this passage, the first three verses of Hebrews 13 is what we covered last week in introducing this final chapter of Hebrews. It really had to do with, spoke of our brotherly love, of course, and the relationship that we have as brothers and sisters in Christ within the church, and really how that affects our other relationships here regarding strangers, regarding those in prison, and the oneness of the body, and how we related that to this, our own present uh, day in the church, in the local church. That brings us to verse 4 today, and I will tell you this will be the only verse that I will cover today because it is such an important, I believe, verse of Scripture. Uh, could spend uh, weeks upon this verse of Scripture, but if we will not do that. I will uh, try to cover and have to say what uh, the Lord has uh, taught me through this in my study. Verse 4, Hebrews 13. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed and the file, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. As I began to study through this, and I looked at some of the, the language of this, and looked at it in some of the original languages, the commentators on this, what I really came to the conclusion of that this was not, I don't even know what translation that you have, and there's nothing wrong with uh, this particular rendering of this scripture. Uh, this is reading from the New King James, but I found the uh, English Standard Version to have really a more uh, accurate translation of this because there's, great, there's an emphasis here. There's really almost like an imperative here in the teaching of this concerning marriage. So let me read this from the English Standard Version, this particular verse of Scripture in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. So what we see and what that writer here begins to speak in these verses this verse in particular that we will deal with today is he begins to speak concerning our own personal conduct and attitudes uh, as believers. As I said before in this chapter, uh, as far as those things which the writer is wanting to deal with concerning the uh, Christ as mediator of the new covenant and the better covenant and, uh, as opposed to the old covenant, those things really have been taught and I think talk clearly through the first 12 chapters of this, and it is as if the writer here is now speaking succinctly concerning some what we would call Christian doctrine and practical Christian doctrine regarding the church. But here in this particular verse, the writer addresses the issue of marriage and sexual immorality. And the reason I believe that both of those our talk here is because if you don't have a correct view of one, you're not going to have a correct view of the other. He's reminding here his readers of the sanctity of marriage. Let marriage be considered honorable or be honored among all. God himself, I believe, ordained and established marriage. He ordained and established the home. And so what he also, I believe, we will see throughout the scriptures as we teach through this verse this morning. It's also what he teaches here is about the dangers and the judgments of God when it comes to sexual immorality. And how much our current society needs to be reminded of this. Our culture is in really a full-scale attack upon marriage, upon the home, upon 
sexual morality slash immorality. In other words, the emphasis in our culture and secular culture is let's get away, let's forget from what the Bible has to say, and let's let our own culture and our own society, wherever we live, dictate to us what is right and what is wrong concerning marriage and morality, particularly in regards to, the, to sex. And so how appropriate this verse of Scripture is to the 21st century and to American culture when marriage is very often seen as optional and sexual immorality in every form is not only flaunted but celebrated and it is seen as being judgmental to even say anything about it being wrong and sinful. In fact, the term racist is thrown around a lot nowadays if you don't have a particular view about uh, sexual morality or immorality if you don't, do not agree with the world's culture. But let's do one thing. Let's understand one thing. As Christians and as the church, our beliefs and our teachings concerning marriage and sexual morality or immorality are dictated by the Word of God. They are not dictated by American culture, Western culture, whatever is going on in this culture. There is nothing new under the sun. This teaching and this attack upon marriage and upon the what God has established as sexual morality has been under attack for 6,000 years, basically. So we're going to go back to the beginning. When God ordained the joining together of man and woman. Turn, if you would, back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 and 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now both man and woman were created by God. Different physically. If you turn over to Genesis chapter 2, and there in verses 18 through 25, we have the account of God seeing that it was not good that man should be alone, causing a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, taking a rib out of Adam's side, and creating from that rib, rib a woman who was to be his companion. So both man and woman were created by God, different physically and emotionally, but meant to complement and support one another. And there needs to be that recognition in marriage that yes, we are different, but we celebrate those differences because God created us so that we would complement one another and fit one another but both equally created in the image of God. That is important to see in that particular scripture. Yes, there is a hierarchy in the home. We believe that. We believe that man is the head of the home. We'll get more into that later. Man is the head of the home. But spiritually speaking, the woman is not any less spiritually than I am if she has been saved by the grace of God. Not any less created in the image of God than the man is. And so in marriage, God designed for husband and wife, as the scriptures teach here, to be joined. Now what does that mean, to be joined? To be joined, in the original language, speaks of, I believe, the permanence of marriage. It speaks of that to be a permanent union. There is nothing to break apart that union because God has established it 
It is a union created by God. But it also speaks of here the one flesh that speaks of the unity and the intimacy of marriage. And we're going to get to that later. But he speaks here of that intimacy, that unity of marriage. We are no longer when we are joined, when we are joined to our wife, when we are married to our wife, men, and vice versa, ladies, you are no longer two separate entities, you are one. And it speaks of that unity, and it speaks of that intimacy that there is to be in marriage. And it is a blessed thing. And this is one of the things that speaks when we say that marriage is outdated, marriage is no longer needed. It takes away that blessing that marriage is, that God created it to be in our lives. In Proverbs 5 and 18, Solomon said there, Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice. Rejoice with the wife of your youth. In Proverbs 18, and there in verse 22, Solomon writes this, He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. We recognize that there is favor in, from the Lord and in that marriage and in that joining together with that particular person. God has favored us in that. It is not happenstance. It is in the providence of God that you are joined together, that you are united together with that spouse that God has given you. And you should see that as a blessing from God. I shudder when I hear particularly men talking about wives as their ball and chain. Yeah. Christian men, that, that term should never be used by us. Right. Amen. She has been given to you by God as His favor, His grace to you. As a gift of grace to complement us, to help us, to be an aid to us. And also, vice versa. I believe that wives should see their husband as a blessing from God. As a protector for her. So that sounds chauvinistic. You can determine however you want it to be. But he is to be that, as we shall see in the scriptures. God also designed marriage, not just for each other's benefit, but also for the benefit of of, of children, the blessing of children who are being considered a gift from God. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, the psalmist said. You look back at Genesis chapter 1 and 28. Before sin ever entered into the Garden of Eden, there was that command there to be fruitful and to multiply in that. Now look back again here at verse 4 of Hebrews. 13. It's very important to look at this word that is used here for marriage. It is the word gamos, G-A-M-O-S. And it basically speaks of a wedding and a wedding feast. And really, in reality, it speaks of the actual joining together of a husband and wife. <coughs> now, many people believe that People should just try out marriage first before they get married. Let's just start living together and try it out. Let me say that. You may think that that's an okay idea as far as the world may think that's an okay idea, but God does not condone that. Amen. The first miracle that Jesus performed was at a wedding feast. I hear people say, I heard someone say one time, oh, they didn't get married in the Bible, they just started living together. No, that is not what happened. You've got a wedding feast, you've got a wedding. Amen. You've got a joining together of man and woman there in a, some type of a formal type set, uh, setting where families have agreed, families have come together. There's this agreement of a man and a woman coming together and joining together in uh, matrimony we would call it and in marriage with all those commitments and recognition of marriage but when we think of this wedding 
a wedding feast, it should bring to mind something else. Perhaps even more importantly, is that marriage is a picture of the union of Christ and his bride, the church. And let me say this. To denigrate, to disdain, to minimize marriage is to disdain the eternal covenant which God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit have made concerning His bride, the church. It is not, it is not just a societal attack. It is an attack against God and what God has ordained and what God sees in marriage here on earth. It is a picture. Marriage here on earth is a picture of God's union with the church. More in particular, God the Son. His union with the church. Amen. In Revelation chapter 19, there in verses 6 through 9, John wrote this, I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters and as the sound of mighty thundering saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give Him glory. Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come, the Lamb who is Jesus Christ has come, and His wife, who is what? Is the church, has made herself ready, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Amen. Then He said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And the picture I see here, of where He talks about to her it was granted in this fine linen, clean and bright. I think about my own daughter here almost two months ago coming down that aisle arrayed in beauty in the fine linen and the white. I think about Miss Taylor back there. <laughs> about a year ago coming down this aisle those are not, I believe, coincidences that we have brides arrayed in such a way because it is a reminder, I believe, of the array and the beauty of the church when the church is presented to Christ in the marriage supper, the marriage feast of the Lamb. Amen. It speaks of that gospel. It speaks of what Christ has done to bring her to that point of what has come up to that point. Amen. So it is great sin, I think, to denounce, to disdain marriage. The marriage of a man and a woman. Now let me say this, just to clarify, there's no such thing as a marriage of a man and a man and a woman and a woman. Right. I don't care what, in all 50 states, vote to legalize that. Yeah. I will never speak of that as marriage. You can count that down. Amen. Okay? That is not marriage. Oh. God designed marriage to be between a man and a woman. God created them male and female. And it speaks of the covenant's covenant. And it speaks of the love which Christ has for his church. That is what it speaks of. Now let me say something to you. You can be turning back over to Ephesians chapter 5 here for, for just a moment. I'm going to read this. But let me say this, and this is a charge to you husbands out there, okay? And to me. I'm preaching to myself. Our role as a husband is to reflect the type of love that Christ has for His church. Not just had, but has and will continue to have throughout time until He calls the church to Himself. And as long as you are here upon this earth as a husband, you are to love her in such a way that it is a reflection and she thinks of Christ in that love. 
ought to be the way it ought to be. That is the way it is. Amen. Look here. Particularly, and I'm going to begin here with verse 25. Husbands, love your wives. And the love there is the love that is the agape love, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And there's several things I want us to see here in this. Let me say this. This love is to be for her benefit. Your love for her ought to benefit her, not be a burden to her. Now, I've known of women that have married men, and, and it's been a struggle because their husbands did not love them as Christ loved the church as they ought to. It's not for your benefit. It's for her benefit. Love her. Christ's love for us it didn't benefit him. It benefited us. It benefited the church. Our love for our wives ought to benefit them. It is for their benefit. But look at the nature of this love. Look at verse 25. He loved the church. He gave himself for her. It is sacrificial. Our love for our wives is to be sacrificial. It is to not, as 1 Corinthians 13 talks about, it is to not seek its own. Love does not seek its own. It does not seek for itself. It does not desire what is just good for us, but it desires her good. It is to benefit her but not only that, and it is to be the type of sacrificial love and that we lay down our lives as Christ laid down His life for the church. Now, I don't think that means just in a physical sense, but it ought to be that way. We ought to lay our lives down physically, if necessary, for our wives and for our families. We ought to do that. But it's also a laying down of our lives in service to them, to take care of them, and to protect them, and to provide for them. We are to be the covering and the strength for that family and for that wife. She is not meant to bear that load. Now, I know there's a lot of strong women out there yeah. that can handle a lot. Yeah. I'm married to them. But there is a great, the greater sense is, is that I am to be her protection. I am to protect her physically, to provide for her physically, and to protect her spiritually. Amen. Husbands, we're to be the spiritual leaders in our home. Our wives are not meant to be that. We are to be that. We are to be the spiritual leaders of our home and protectors for them and do that in a sacrificial way, to sacrifice our time and ourselves. In verse 27, this love is also seen that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she, be, she should be holy without blemish. That love is to be sanctified. It is to be sanctified. My love for her is to be such a, a love that it makes her more holy. To present her holy and glorious to lead her closer in her walk with the Lord. Now, do we do that perfectly? Of course not, because we're, in ourselves, we're still sinful creatures. We're still in this sinful body. But we are to recognize that role that God has given us, and that blood is meant to do that. We should never lead our wives into sin, to ask them to do anything which is going to to be a, grie a grieving of the Holy Spirit and, and drag them down spiritually. Our love is to be such that it draws them closer more to the image of Christ. It conforms them more to the image of Christ. And then in verse 29 he says, For no one ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. The Lord nourishes and cherishes his church. His love for the church is eternal. And he nourishes the church through the word of God and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit and those that he has put within the local body to, to nourish that body. And in the same way, we as husbands are to nourish 
our wives spiritually. And we are to cherish them as the most precious thing that we have here upon the earth. Amen. Amen. It, that, that's right. That's the way it ought to be. The most precious thing that we have that God has ever given us here on the earth in a physical form is our lives. Amen. As great a gift as our children are, the, most, the thing we are to cherish the most is our lives. That relationship should come first. Not our jobs, not our hobbies, <coughs> not our likes, but that wife that God has given. And that's why that marriage is honorable because God has ordained it just not for our benefit, but also as a picture of Christ's covenant relationship with his bride, the church. It is a reflection of what Christ has done and is doing for the church. You see, it's not just about what he has done, it's what he continues to do. He's continuing to minister to his church, to provide for his bride spiritually, to present her to himself as a glorious bride in righteousness. have a value upon what marriage represented? Did he see this same thing? And we've already spoken of in John chapter 2 how this first miracle was there at this marriage supper. He turned the water into wine. We believe that that was by accident. No, that he associated himself with a, a marriage where he could go. But there were other scriptures that speak of when Christ comes again that this speaks of the relationship of Christ and His church. Turn over to the book of Matthew in just a moment. Matthew chapter 22. And there in verses 1 through 14. I'm not going to read all of that particular passage of Scripture. I'm going to read a portion of it. A few verses here. Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for his son. Like the king represents, he the son. And he sent out his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding, and they were not willing to come. I believe this speaks of the call to the, to the Israelites, to the Jews. They were his chosen ethnic people, but they would not come. They rejected Christ. And he sent other servants. He tell those who are invited, see, I've prepared my dinner, my, my oxen, fatted calf or kill and all things are ready come to the wedding, the invitation they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm, another to his business and the rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them I think that you could make an analogy there to the prophets that were sent to those that preached and invited to Christ but they rejected but the king heard about it, he was furious he said his armies destroyed those murderers and burned up their city here's the judgment of God on those that have rejected Christ. Then he said to his servants, the wedding is ready, but those who are invited were not worthy. Therefore, go to the highways, as many as you find, and back to the wedding. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered all of whom they found both bad and good, and the wedding was filled with guests. We're going to stop right there. But there's a picture there, I believe, of the invitation of all, of all tribes and tongues and nations to come to the wedding feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb. There's the call there that He has. You see, there's going to be a great wedding feast one day, and all those being redeemed by the by the by the Lamb and are a part of His bride, the by the church, will be present. I believe that. I believe that they're all going to be there. And we look, we'll look at Revelation here in a few moments, but that is the picture of all of those that have been in, that, that are of the church, that are of his of his of his bride, are going to be there. They will be there. The right, writer not only says here that marriage is honorable, which means dear and precious and beloved and esteemed, but again here, and let's let's Get a little, we get a little, maybe a frank, and I hope that none of you are uncomfortable with this, but it says the, the bed under fire. Yeah. What is he talking about there? He's talking about sex. Yeah. 
sexual union, sexual morality, and immorality. In other words, the marriage bed is undefiled, it is unpolluted, it is incorruptible. Let me say this, God created sex. He created that. Even to be practiced before Adam and Eve sinned. But sin has polluted that. Sin has created problems as it always has and always will. And he created this for the blessing and the pleasure and the propagation of children in marriage. You look at Proverbs chapter 5, you see that. You look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verses 1 through 8. But let me say that it is to be limited to marriage. And if it's outside of marriage, it is sin. S-I-N. And what he says here, that fornicators and adulterers, God will judge the sexually immoral, God will judge. Sex outside of marriage is against the revealed will of God and against the law of God, and God has not abrogated that. Amen. It is still true, no matter what century it is. It's not only against that, it's against the holy character of God. It is outside the covenant of God, and He's going to judge it accordingly. Again, there are those in our culture and in past cultures who desire to fulfill their sexual desires outside of marriage and say it is their right and to do so without consequence. Uh, I see so much nowadays about drugs that are created to do away with the consequences of sexual immorality. You have HIV, you have AIDS, all sorts of sexually transmitted diseases. And so now I see all these advertisements on TV about all of these different drugs. And well, if you take this, then, then, then it's going to do away with the consequences of what should have been inside marriage, but it's outside of marriage. There's always going to be consequences. You can do away, perhaps, with physical consequences, but you can't do away with the, the spiritual consequences and the emotional scars and the psychological scars from those things. You cannot do away with that. The only, the only way that can be done away with is through the Spirit of God and through the saving grace of God. But there are always consequences. And there's been this immorality. If you look back at Genesis chapter 6 and verses 5 through 8, and it talks there about in the early days of the world that the evil of man was continual and he grieved God so greatly that what did he do? He sent a flood and he destroyed the earth. He brought his judgment upon that. And I have no doubt that much of that immorality and that evil had to do with this sexual immorality here. Yeah. You look at Genesis chapter 18 and 19 there and the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and we, we understand that there was great sexual immorality there in that place and and God destroyed that place because of that. There were consequences upon that because their sin cried out there. Proverbs chapter 5 and the first 14 verses there are a warning against adultery and the consequences of that. Her steps, it says there, of the adulteress leads down where? To hell. There's a great sin against God. Sin against someone else, really. Bring consequences to you. But be, and some said people say, well, the old, that's the Old Testament. I, I, I live in the New Testament time. I'm sure that that's different. No, it's not any different. God's standard is still clear regarding this sin, especially for the Christian. Especially for the Christian. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 3 through 8. For 
this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified, for God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. I've known people that call themselves Christians that basically said, I'm just going to go live with so-and-so. I'm just going to try this out. It's immorality. It's against the revealed will of God. You can say what you want to. You can think you're going to get away with it, but you don't get away with it. Especially for the believer. If a believer takes that particular stance, there's going to be some consequences to come, especially for the believer. Because those that the Lord loves, He punishes. He disciplines in that regard. Now, and, and to see how God holds that in such high esteem, you look in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, what was it that Paul spoke to the Corinthian church there about? There was sexual immorality there that had polluted the church. He said, root it out. Discipline this one. Put them out of the church. Be a lot of people probably in this day and time if we put people out for that. That would be, it would thin out their membership rolls quite a bit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, speaks of the works of the flesh and sexual immorality of all kinds is spoken of in that. Now, let me, before I go any farther in this, let me just say one thing. The immorality of of homosexuality, the sin of homosexuality is not greater than the sin of heterosexual immorality outside of marriage. It's the same sin. It's the same, I believe, consequences. There are those in culture that are not Christians They want to talk about homosexuality as, as being against God. Well, it is against God, but so is your heterosexual uh, sexual immorality, just in, as heinous in the eyes of God. It is. So don't make yourself out of it. If you're practicing that, if someone practicing that, to make out like somehow your immorality is less than that, their immorality. It's not. It's not. It'll still be punished by God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. We'll move on to that here in a moment. Because I, I hear this. That it seems that there is in this culture this idea that I can continue <coughs> to practice this, that I can continue to do this, but because I have made a profession of faith and I've been baptized, and no matter if I can, if I even continue in this lifestyle, that somehow I have security of the believer, and somehow I am going to be with, with Christ in his heaven. Verse 9, 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Not going to happen. You practice such things, you will not be going to heaven. But he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Can someone that has practiced this in the past be forgiven of that and be saved and be redeemed and go to heaven? Absolutely yes. I've heard the teaching some have said before, I don't believe that a homosexual can be saved and be redeemed and go to heaven. That's not true. Okay. Paul said, I know some of you that practice that lifestyle and you redeem, but you were, that's what you used to be, but you're justified and you're sanctified by the Lord Jesus Christ. So the scripture is clear that those who are sexually immoral will have no place in God's kingdom or at the marriage feast of Christ to his church. How do you know that? That's a bold statement. Scriptures we've already read are not enough. Then listen to this. 
Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake, which is merged with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. And then in chapter 22, verses 14 and 15, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and they enter through the gates of the city. But outside are dogs and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters who never love and practice the life. That's pretty funny. Those people that practice such a lifestyle, they engage it and continue to engage it, will not be, are not part of the kingdom of God. They will not go to heaven. Or any other sin that you they gladly participate. And there are those who say, well, I believe in the God of love. So do I. God of love, not one of us would be here this morning. God so loved the world that he gave his own to God's Son. His river leaves him. He should not perish and have everlasting. We love him walking. They believe it because of that, he's going to overlook sex, their immorality, their disobedience to the revealed will of God. We, were, we sang that song this morning, the last song, purpose. Holy will of God. What is God? <coughs> holy will of God. He's not somehow going to forget the standard. He's not going to somehow forget his word. Let me ask this question. Will God understand? Will God overlook the desecration of marriage? Will He overlook His standard of sexual morality? And just say, oh, that's okay. Come in. The scriptures claim to teach those who practice such things who have desecrated, who have disdained the movements of marriage. God has established his word. God established from the very beginning. The answer to that question of whether or not he's going to bypass that is a clear no. God established marriage union, benefit, man, woman, and I think is a beautiful picture of union of Christ. Thank you. 